What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Jagged Alliance 3. The follow-up, of course, to Jagged Alliance 2, but the second game was actually released all the way back in 1999. So receiving a sequel almost 24 years later is pretty remarkable in and of itself, but beyond that, the game is a TRPG primarily that sees us making a lot of choices and consequences that ultimately define the future of a fictional country known as Grand Chien. Before we dive into all of that though, it's important to note that I actually did receive a review copy of this game ahead of time, even though it released more than a week ago now. Originally it released on the 14th, I had it a little bit early on the 12th, and the reason it took so long to do this review is that the game is substantially larger than I thought. So naturally we'll be going over a lot of that in this review. Beyond just that, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers on the platform, and while that does does include the achievements, it also includes a lot more than that. Linked below is a video explaining everything that I go over, my Steam profile is public and linked below as well. Though on the topic of achievements for this game in particular, there's a couple things to know. For starters, one of them is bugged, so I don't actually have that one. It is a story-related achievement that happens roughly halfway through the game or so. And given that no one has it, I'm inclined to believe it's just completely bugged. But in regards to that, this is a game that is going to have a pretty big emphasis on modding and the community around that. So with that in mind, having mods enabled for this game doesn't actually disable the achievements, which means between that fact, the mods not actually disabling anything, thus making some of them easier through mods, and the fact that the mods themselves will change the gameplay long term, how much value you want to assign to that is ultimately up to you. Now, from there, as I mentioned, the game is largely a TRPG, a game that features both strategy and tactical elements, which comes down to controlling a squad of mercenaries or a more world map focused view where we focus on defending objectives and controlling choke points on the map via outposts, so to speak. As a sequel to Jagged Alliance 2, it's probably also important to note that as a series, it likes to poke fun at the concept of 80s action movies, so some of it is very much so over the top and can definitely have a sort of bombastic silly tone at times, juxtaposed against the more serious events of this war-torn country. But at a base level, we're going to be hiring mercenaries, engaging in and tactical battles, all while trying to achieve our goals for which we were hired to sort out some of the problems this country is facing, which are many and varied. This is going to bring us into contact with many people from the previous game in the series, some directly, some indirectly, and much like the previous game, this game will feature robust modding support like I mentioned. This comes with Steam Workshop support, so many of the things that I mention as negatives or problems might very well be solved by a potential mod that you could use. As it stands right now at the time of this recording, there's already over a hundred mods for this over on the Steam Workshop, so something to keep in mind to be sure. Beyond that, the game also features a multiplayer mode, so if you happen to get done with the exhaustive single-player campaign, you can play with friends in an online co-op mode. From there, though, I want to speak about the difficulty of the game, because if you're not familiar with this genre or these types of games, it might come across as quite difficult even on normal, and while there are ultimately ways to trivialize things, until you get to grips with some of those mechanics, it's very important to know where you stand in terms of difficulties. The game features three base difficulties and then a set of options known as game rules which will affect how you can save and things like that. The three difficulties themselves are First Blood, Commando, and Mission Impossible. First Blood is considered normal, that's the base default experience, but if you want a greater challenge afterwards you can jump up to Commando and Mission Impossible. The main thing that increases here is that enemies become more dangerous, yes, but much more impactful is the fact that you receive less money and loot as those are significant resources that you will get less of. When it comes to game rules, by far the most important is Forgiving Mode. Forgiving Mode does a few things, but in the regular game, there's a good bit of attrition from enemies. Things you need to do like heal or repair your equipment cost you time, and enemies will be assaulting your bases and trying to take things away from you. Forgiving Mode eases up that attrition rate, basically, by giving you a small amount of base income per day, whereas other Otherwise, you have to earn all of your money by finding loot, capturing mines, etc. And this small little trickle of income from the forgiving mode can help you avoid being 
getting backed into a corner where you simply run out of money. But another thing this does is reduce the time it takes to heal and repair equipment, as that's something you'll have to be doing from time to time, and the longer it takes as time is passing, the more likely you are to be attacked, you'll have to pay out more money for mercenary contracts, so the reduction there also makes things easier. The other two options are Dead is Dead and To the Bitter End. Dead is Dead means progress is saved automatically, meaning things like every death and choice are final. This is effectively an Iron Man mode. And then lastly is To the Bitter End, where you cannot save the game during combat. Without these two options on, the game auto-saves basically every turn, so you can roll back a problem you might have by simply reloading, unless, of course, you turn one of these options on. So, you have a variety of ways to make the game fairly easy or more difficult depending on what you do. In all of those cases, there's a few things you can do in combat, and I would almost call them exploits in nature that make it kind of trivial, and we'll get to that in the combat section. Moving on from there, though, let's talk about the story setup for this game. We will be commanding a group of mercenaries who are hired to rescue the president of a fictional country, again known as Grand Chien. The president was kidnapped by a paramilitary organization known as Legion, who has effectively started holding the country hostage, and our job as a mercenary company is to sweep in and deal with this and hopefully save the president's life. And while that's as much as I want to say for the sake of spoilers, it is substantially more interesting in that just in regards to the main plot, but also in regards to all of the side content. The story's going to see the return of many characters from the previous games. There's a lot of choice and consequence both for the main story as well as all of the side content, and much of what you do there is going to decide the state of the country when you are finished with the game, because there are a variety of endings. I would say there's mostly a sort of good and bad ending primarily, but each individual area of the country can have other problems you might want to deal with that are considered secondary technically, but nonetheless how you deal with them and approach them will affect the long-term outcome of those places. These revolve around dealing with a mysterious plague known as Red Rabies. One area even has a serial killer running loose, just to give a few examples. So there's a wealth of content that all leans into choice and consequence, and most of that was really fun to mess around with. My only real complaint there is that depending on how you approach things, as you're largely free to engage in all of this however you please, it's very non-linear in nature, can lead to some sequence breaking, which can cause a few problems here and there, some bugged quests, things like that. But by and large, I enjoyed the main story, and it provides a fun vehicle to experience the rest of the game's content. Now from there, we're going to talk about progression systems and our mercenaries. So a big part of progression in this game is the mercenaries themselves, which is where I want to start. We're going to be hiring mercenaries on a contractual basis to do most of this work. The mercenaries are divided up into several tiers based on how good they are at the start of the game, but over the course of the game they can also level up and gain in power, and how you outfit them will also have a very big impact on them. Of the available mercs that we can hire, they each have their own unique perks that make them different and behave in combat in various ways compared to other mercenaries beyond just their general skill set, though they do each have a sort of class associated with them. But further still, they all actually have their own personality. Some of them have relationships with other mercenaries in the available pool of hireable ones. This will cause them to potentially charge you more to work with certain other people. Some will refuse to join your squads while you are employing another one of them, and just little back and forth things like that. It's also possible for some of them not to be available all the time, and you will generally be hiring them on a short-term basis, the span of a few days, and this is going to cost you money. This is why money is such a limiting factor, so to speak, in what you are able to do, especially when it comes to having to spend the time you have those mercenaries doing things like healing, repairing equipment, or training militia. As these mercenaries level up, they will get access to more and more perks based on their stats, and these perks will generally give them some benefit in combat, with some of them being incredibly impactful and allowing them to specialize in a certain playstyle. For the most part, it's things you would expect. You can make them healers, tanks, more stealth-focused characters with high crit chance, the usual stuff. You can have up to six mercs in a squad, which makes our general party size for each individual combat six. The best mercs in the game aren't available right at the gate. They are hidden behind what is called gold status, which is essentially a one-time fee you pay to your mercenary organization to 
allow you to hire the best of the best. This is simply an in-game mechanic to keep you from getting the best mercenaries possible immediately, though a short ways into the game you can make that one-time fee and then you'll be able to purchase the best mercenaries, which are very strong fighters right out of the gate. Though it's worth mentioning that all of the mercenaries can be quite strong, especially with their unique perks, provided you take the time to level them up and use them in combat. In addition to just that combat-oriented stuff, though, each mercenary has a variety of stats. These are attributes that will affect many different things, such as carry capacity, action points in combat, how far they can move, but also things that are not related to combat. A stat like Wisdom will let you spot hidden things, and there are also certain conversational checks around medicine in particular. Having a high medicine will decrease the time it takes to heal injured mercs. Explosives will let someone deactivate mines and things you come across in the field without potentially taking damage. So beyond just what they can do in combat, each mercenary also has a set of skills that will make them useful in other ways. All things to consider when using them. And that's before we even start talking about the weapons and their modifications or the armor available to them. Armor is pretty straightforward. Each mercenary gets a head, body, and leg slot that they can equip equipment to that will reduce incoming damage. These can be modified a little bit with the Things that will typically just reduce incoming damage even farther. Though if you are using heavy types of armor, you can be restricted from certain actions like free movement abilities, which is something to keep in mind. Now when it comes to weapons, there's a variety of weapons in general. There are pistols, sniper rifles, assault rifles, heavy machine guns, mortars, things like that, all of which can be set up. And that's before we even start talking about more throwable things like throwing knives, grenades, explosives in general, proximity, C4, for melee weapons that allow for silent stealth kills. There's a lot going on, but it's important to remember that weapons can also be modified in various ways to give them benefits beyond what that weapon would normally have. You'll find weapons with some mods just attached. Improving these mods or adding them requires both the materials to make said mod and also a high mechanic skill to actually make it happen. If you fail at attaching a mod, you'll actually degrade the weapon's condition, causing it to need to be repaired much more quickly, which requires its own resource. This is especially important because if you want to use silenced weapons and take a more stealth approach, this is how you're going to do that. You're going to attach silencers here. And that's very important because as we'll get to, melee stealth mechanics are very finicky. It's a very clunky system. So attaching silencers to weapons is a big part of making a stealth character, even if it's not initially available. The last thing I want to talk about in terms of our mercs, though, is your custom merc. While you will mostly be hiring mercenaries, it is also possible to play through this game completely solo or with a very small group of mercenaries as opposed to the full six-man crew. And what makes your custom mercenaries special is that you don't have to pay them at regular intervals. You pay a one-time fee to make a custom character one time, at which point that mercenary becomes your sort of avatar, if you will. The options for visual customization for this are very limited, by the way. But beyond that, you can largely turn this mercenary into whatever you need them to be. And the fact that they don't cost anything over time makes this one an especially valuable mercenary. And on that note, one of the best ways to get your mercenaries incredibly strong very quickly is training. One of the activities we can undergo on the world map is mercenary training, where we have mercenaries that are really good with one particular stat train another mercenary who is not, and you can increase a mercenary statistics this way, and it is definitely the fastest way to do this, because while stats can very much so increase and upgrade over time while you play the game and use them, this training option is much, much faster, and while there is a bit of a maximum, it's possible if you have enough time to max out a mercenary this way, which can make them very, very strong, and is one of the ways you can sort of cheese the combat a little bit. From there, though, let's talk about the rest of the gameplay. Gameplay is primarily divided up into the satellite map and the tactical map. The tactical map is where we'll actually be manually moving our mercenaries around, engaging in combat and the like, and the satellite map is the bigger sort of strategy layer where we can see various enemy outposts, towns, things that we need to control and get to. This is divided up up into sectors, and each sector is its own tactical map, which will come with its own unique trials, quests potentially, among other things. One of the critical things you'll want to do in this game is take over towns in particular, because towns affect mines, but 
Towns usually also have various side quests you can undertake, things to find, and while there aren't really a lot of shops because buying and selling as a base mechanic is very clunky as well, you can find unique equipment here. And once you've claimed a town, it's also very likely that the Legion organization will try to take it back from you, which is why you need to train militia to defend it while you're not around. When these battles happen, they can auto-resolve because you won't be there, but having militia keeps towns under your control provided you remember to actually train them up. Something I found useful in the late game was to control choke points on the map by essentially keeping one mercenary parked at various towns so I didn't have to waste time moving around the map, and use them specifically to train militia while I worked on overthrowing enemy outposts. I mentioned mines. Our primary source of money making is controlling the diamond mines on the map. We have to go to these mines, clear out the enemy via a tactical battle, at which point we can take that mine over and start producing money for ourselves. How much money an individual mine makes is based on how much the nearby town likes you, which itself depends on how you've been treating them, whether or not you've just been wantonly murdering civilians, that kind of thing, and also whether or not you've done quests or solved their problems. Doing this will get you more money out of a mine, though it is important to know mines are not an endless resource. They can run dry. This is one of the ways that money and time are a limited resource. But when an enemy is controlling a mine, they will be making sure shipments of these diamonds to various outposts and places on the map. You can intercept these shipments and take these diamonds and sell them or cash them in as it calls it, which is an alternative way of making money. Now when it comes to enemies and outposts, there's a couple important things to know. Some sectors of the map will just have a static enemy group, if you will. You'll fight these enemies, do whatever's going on in that sector, and then move on. But then we have our outposts. Outposts are where enemies will actually send out specific warbands, so to speak, to take back towns and mercenaries from. So if you want to stop these attacks, you need to take out the enemy outposts. Each outpost, however, has a variety of intel, as it's called, associated with it. This is represented by the shields above an outpost. Taking care of these individual things can weaken an outpost before you decide to try to capture it. This will vastly reduce the number of enemies you need to fight and weaken their defenses, while also giving you more information about the battlefield you're stepping into, which can inform your approach on the tactical level. There's a couple ways to find out what this intel actually is because you do need to find out about it, and this can be done by the scouting satellite map operation, which will let you use some of your mercenaries to scout around and try to find out things, or you can just happen across the intel. So while it's possible to sort of storm an outpost at full strength, that can be a difficult thing to do, and you're usually better off weakening it first. There are a variety of outposts over the map, and the enemy will send enemies to try to take back its outposts. But by capturing outposts, you can reduce the rate at which the enemy is attacking you, which by itself is very useful, and that combined with controlling certain choke points like I mentioned via militias, there are ways to effectively control the map even in spite of the attrition rate. Because once you play the game for a little while, you'll start to notice there are very specific paths the AI will typically send the attacking enemy squads through, and if you control those points, you don't really have to worry about much. Now once you've taken an outpost and say an enemy takes it back or something, retaking that outpost post on subsequent times will be much easier and you'll be allowed to just auto resolve the battle, which can be much quicker than fighting for it manually. But in doing all that, your mercenaries are likely to be injured or damage their equipment. Some of our operations on the world map include healing everyone, provided you have a doctor, outside of just going to something like a hospital in a town, and this is going to take time and medicine. So in order to heal, you have to have medicine, and the cost of how much medicine you need will increase based on how grievous the injuries are. And in a game, game that limits you with time and money, it's important to try to minimize damage to your mercenaries. As your mercenaries take damage, they can be wounded in various ways, starting with wounds, which will reduce your max health until they are healed, or just things like slowing them down, making them more inaccurate, the usual stuff. Repairing equipment is pretty straightforward. It has a percentage durability associated with it. It will get damaged as you use it or get hit, 
and you have to spend parts, which you get by either scrapping weapons or finding them, to repair them, which also costs you time. So when it comes to playing the game and controlling the map, the biggest things you need to remember are time and money. If you're playing effectively, you should have plenty of both. It's very possible to have millions of dollars worth of cash towards the end of the game, but that does require you to understand these mechanics and make the most of them, which is kind of hard to do on a first run, admittedly. As we move through the game and participate in all of that, though, I did want to highlight the side quests in particular. I've already talked about this a little bit, but just as a reminder, every area you're going to and clearing out can have the potential to have a lot of side quests, and many of them were genuinely interesting, and how you approach those and what you do about them can very much so affect the ending of the game in many ways, which is probably my favorite part about it overall. From there, though, let's finally talk about combat. Ultimately, combat is a turn-based action point system. It is also a a team-based system, meaning that you will go, the enemy will go, and then any third party, such as civilians, will take their turn, which is usually just running around, that kind of thing. Your actions can be taken to either simply move as far as you can, move and attack, set up overwatches, the general stuff you're used to in any kind of turn-based game. One key thing to note, though, is that you do not get a percentage chance to hit when looking at an enemy. Rather, the developers stated that they wanted people to play by feel, so to speak, more than min-max it into a puzzler. So because of that, when you are looking at an enemy, you will get plus or minuses to your accuracy based on a variety of things like cover, etc. And this will determine how likely you are to hit. You never see a percentage chance, though there is a mod to show it for you. In addition to that, when targeting an enemy, you can potentially target one of five parts of their body, and you can also spend extra action points when attacking to aim to increase your chance to hit. Hitting certain body parts will of course have different effects, and naturally hitting people in the head is the most effective way to go. Beyond that, there's a variety of weapons available to you, though I will say sniper rifles and explosives tend to be the most effective, as they are high damage and high accuracy. Another thing to keep in mind is actually the weather. As you move through various sectors, there is a sort of dynamic weather happening, and those conditions such as fog or rain will have various effects on the battlefield that can manifest themselves in various ways. Ultimately, Ultimately, though, I did find combat after a certain point does kind of turn into more and more of the same. For instance, towards the end of the game, on my first playthrough, I was using a full team of essentially snipers, and they would just destroy enemies from afar before they could even get close, and that's probably the most effective way I found to play. And that's before you even consider attaching things like silencers to sniper rifles to take a stealthy approach. Now, when it comes to stealth, there's a few things to know. It's a little awkward. And this is because the game utilizes a real-time setup phase. Before you're actually seen by enemies, you'll be free to move around as you want. It's not in turn-based yet. However, once you get alerted to enemies, they will then start turn-based mode. You can be found by enemies simply by walking into spotlights, walking into their view, at which point a heat bar underneath your characters will fill up until you are spotted formally. The closer you are to an enemy, the faster this will fill up until you are eventually spotted. But enemies can also hear gunshots and see bodies. Now when it comes to seeing bodies, that's probably the most frustrating part of stealth because Enemies seem to be able to see a dead body from across the map almost, which can be a little frustrating when you're going for stealth. And this is where something like a silent sniper rifle comes in because it solves most of those problems for you. You can one-shot enemies outside of combat before it's ever really an issue, and that's an incredibly strong way to play the game. And if you're going solo, it's likely how you'll approach it. Now, the other part of this is sort of an, I wouldn't say exploit because it's technically a game mechanic, but it's possible to retreat in combat. If you make it towards the start of a sector, it's possible to retreat back to the satellite map. However, what you can do here is use something like a sniper to pick off a few enemies, retreat back to the satellite map, and then re-enter the zone immediately, which resets combat and allows you to go kill a few more enemies. And if you use that method, most areas can just 
just be thoroughly swept with minimal effort, while at the same time taking barely any damage, if any at all. But for the most part, as a matter of opinion, I would say combat is pretty fun. There's a variety of options. There are a few things I would like to see changed a little bit. A pause mode to the real time would help immensely, which is primarily for the Steam Deck and melee stealth. The system they have works fine for, again, you know, like a silent sniper rifle, trying to get up close to an enemy and also manage all of your mercenaries and this heat bar is very difficult and a pause mode would really help out there just at a base level. And on the Steam Deck especially, because the controls there, while functional, are a little clunkier and take longer to navigate, which makes trying to do this on the Steam Deck much, much more difficult. So a pause mode in the real-time portions would go a long, long way. But more than anything, I had a lot of fun with combat. Some of the clunkiness of it can get frustrating at times, especially if you're not using that chance to hit mod, but by and large, I like the system they made there, and given what modders are likely to do with it and what they could potentially do with it is interesting in and of itself. So for the most part, I enjoyed it. It does kind of scratch that tactical itch without being terribly demanding, even if there are some sort of clear winners in terms of approaches. That though brings us to our Steam Deck section. Officially, this game has a rating of playable on Steam, and I would largely agree with that. It does have some good things going for it though. We've got our cloud saves, controller support, which can definitely help move you around. Now, as I mentioned just a minute ago, one of the Steam Deck's main problems is trying to control a large amount of mercenaries in the real-time mode before you're spotted by enemies. The controller version of this, while certainly functional and not bad once you get a feel for it, takes a little bit longer than it does on PC where you just have to click something. And that time difference can be very frustrating when you're trying to set up stealth kills if you are playing on the Steam Deck. Now, if you just go in guns blazing, this likely isn't going to affect you very much, but there's some potential there for the controls to be frustrating on that platform. But that said, a cool thing about it is that in terms of performance and how it runs, the game actually has a dedicated Steam Deck setting on the graphics side of things, so it does run pretty well. You can adjust them farther down if that's important to you to get an even smoother bit, but they do have a dedicated graphics setting for the Steam Deck, which means that the only real reason it has a playable rating is down to things like the size of text, which is very, very small on that screen. You could potentially have a lot of fun with this on Steam Deck, though personally it's probably not something I would play on it. And that is going to bring us to our positives, negatives, and then we will wrap this thing up. So on the positive side of things, we have all the choice and consequence related questing and the fun combat. There are so many fun side quests that have a variety of outcomes, there's so many choices involved, and then I was pleasantly surprised to see all of that reflected in the ending slides of the game. And in that regard, I think they did a really great job. And that combined with combat that is fun to engage with are the primary things you would want from a TRPG that is definitely leaning a little heavier on the RPG side of things than these games typically do. Now, on the negative side of things, there's a handful of systems that feel like they lack some polish, there's some sequence breaking bugs when it comes to questing, and there's a lot of stuff where it feels like the intention was very much so to let modders fill out that system, such as our own custom mercenary. There's almost zero customization options there in terms of what they actually look like. We also have have the sort of clunky melee stealth approaches. We have the lack of a pause mode when you're in the real time portion of the gameplay. And that's just to name a few, but there's a variety of things like that throughout the game that once you've learned about them and learn how to play around them, they're easy enough to ignore. So I don't think they get in the way of the experience too much, but I could also see someone running into those things and getting very frustrated. And ultimately, some of that clunkiness is what drags down and otherwise really fun to engage with experience that has a lot to offer. So it's unfortunate that those things are there because while mods are very likely to fix them, and I acknowledge that, those problems are what is holding this game back from being really, really great. And that brings me to my conclusion. Ultimately, Jagged Alliance 3 is a really fun TRPG with a lot going for it that includes a great amount of choice and consequence, fun combat, but has a variety of rough edges that can sour the experience somewhat. However, 
starter, for someone like myself, that's not really a big deal, and for the game's $45 asking price, it gets a pretty easy buy from me, as I enjoyed my time with this game quite a bit, which was substantially more time than I was expecting to spend on it. Now, whether or not this is a worthy successor to Jagged Alliance 2 is something I'll have to leave for other people to decide, as I do not have a ton of experience with the previous games, but I can say I enjoyed 3 a great deal as someone who plays a lot of games in this genre. That said, that has been my review after 100% for Jagged Alliance 3. I certainly hope you enjoyed it. If you did, like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day. Thank you.